Hi, I'm Doug Jensen, and welcome to my master class for Sony's PXW-Z90, HXR NX80, and FDR AX700. Three cameras that are nearly identical except for a few differences that may or may not even be very important to you. Now, if you've seen any of my previous camcorder master classes, you'll know that normally I'm in a studio with cameras, lights, monitors, and all sorts of equipment. But this class is going to be a little different because I'm on the road shooting for several months and I don't have time to travel back home just so I can stand in the studio and talk to you about the camera. So I'm trying a totally different approach this time. Welcome to my new studio. But don't worry, this will still be a thorough breakdown of all three cameras. Thanks to my friends at Sony, I had the opportunity to start working with the Z90 demo camera a couple of months before they started shipping. And that gave me plenty of time to learn the camera inside and out, even before mine was delivered. And for the next few hours, I'll share what I've learned over the last few weeks and get you up to speed on operating your camera as quickly as possible. What Sony seems to be doing with these three new cameras is proving once again that they have a suitable camera for everyone. As I said before, they're all very similar. Sony just adds a few more features to each model as you work your way up from the AX700 to the NX80 and then the Z90. In my opinion, the AX700 is aimed at advanced amateurs who want to shoot professional quality 4K video but don't really need all the extra bells and whistles that a professional requires. I think the NX80 is geared towards students, wedding videographers, and people who record events, meetings, and other types of non-broadcast productions. And the full-featured Z90 has obviously been designed to meet the needs and expectations of seasoned professionals, broadcasters, journalists, and sports producers. But there's no reason why all three of these cameras couldn't perform well in any of those environments. And once you've mastered one camera, then you've pretty much mastered them all. Before we talk about how they differ, let's briefly talk about some of the great features they have in common. But I don't want to spend too much time on this part because that's not the purpose of this masterclass. This is not a promotional video to sell cameras. I'm not going to tell you which camera is right for you. I'm not going to compare the cameras to similar models from other manufacturers. And I'm certainly not going to get under the hood and explain in detail how the technology works. Well, okay, maybe we'll peek under the hood a little bit when it's appropriate, but the focus of this masterclass is always going to be on teaching you what I think you need to know in order to become an expert on the operation of your camera. All three cameras are basically ready to roll the minute you unpack them from the box. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars extra for lenses and lens adapters. They're well balanced and feel great in the hand. They have extensive manual controls and plenty of external buttons and switches that should satisfy the most advanced operators. They all boast the same advanced one inch sensor with super fast readout so there's virtually no unwanted rolling shutter effects at any focal length. They each offer dozens of recording formats to choose from including 24p, 30p, 25p, 4k, HD, NTSC, and PAL. They'll even let you record lightweight proxy files if you want to. They all have an amazing fast hybrid autofocus system which uses 273 phase detection points that cover 84% of the frame and work in conjunction with the standard contrast detection autofocus mode to track moving subjects better than I could do myself manually. It is by far the best autofocus system I've ever encountered on a video camera. But autofocus isn't just on or off, it can also be customized in dozens of ways to meet your individual preferences and to improve performance during different types of shooting situations. Each of the cameras uses the same beautiful Zeiss lens with a 12x optical zoom and silky smooth manual focusing. They allow full manual control of exposure, white balance and focus. They have a built-in 4-step ND filter. They have an infrared shooting mode that allows you to shoot when there's no visible light at all. They record high quality 24-bit 48kHz audio. All three cameras can capture time-lapse footage in 4K. And I want to point out that that's something that even Sony's Z150 cannot do. They're all equipped with an excellent flip-out LCD monitor plus a very sharp OLED viewfinder at the rear. In fact, I'm sure there's no other cameras in this class that have a better viewfinder. They have steady shot image stabilization. They're all capable of shooting with S-Log2 and S-Log3 for high dynamic range production, just like Sony's F55, FS7, and FS5 cinema cameras. Plus, they all have a customizable hybrid log gamma mode, or HLG, for instant high dynamic range production without the need for color grading in post. 
HLG is a relatively new delivery standard that simplifies high dynamic range production by enabling a single video stream to be displayed simultaneously on HDR and SDR television screens. But what if you're not ready for HDR production? Well, you're in luck because all three cameras also have 10 different picture profile memory banks that can be customized in almost limitless ways using dozens of paint menus to create beautiful, what you see is what you get images right straight out of the camera with no color grading or monkeying around in post. In addition, they all have time code, two types of zebras, customizable peaking, a histogram, six programmable assigned buttons, clear image zoom, digital extender, dual memory card slots, an HDMI jack, gamma display assist, relay recording, a link connector for wired remotes, and the list goes on and on. Okay, I'm gonna stop myself now because rattling off a list of features is not what we're here for. Instead, let's move on to how these three cameras are different from each other. What do you lose or gain with one camera versus another? Well, that's a tougher question to answer than you might think because even Sony's own marketing materials leave out some things that I've discovered on my own. So to the best of my knowledge, these are the main differences between the three cameras. First, there's the price. Right now in January 2018, here's what these cameras will set you back at retailers in the USA. Amazingly inexpensive for what you get, really. In fact, the price of a Z90 is barely half the cost of what a single AXS memory card costs for my F55. Only the Z90 and NX80 feature a detachable handle that comes equipped with dual XLR audio inputs, a built-in shotgun microphone mount, and quite a number of essential controls for recording professional quality audio manually. Only the Z90 can capture video in the XAVC-L recording format, which has 10-bit 422 color in HD and 8-bit 420 color in 4K. While the NX80 and AX700 record in the more consumer-oriented XAVC-S format, with 8 bit 420 color in both 4K and HD. The AX700 has fewer AVC HD recording format options than the other two cameras. The NX80 and AX700 have a couple of 120p formats that aren't found on the Z90. Now, I'm not exactly sure what you're going to do with a 120p codec in post, but they do have it. In addition to the Z90's built-in XAVC-L codecs, you can also purchase an additional software upgrade that will add several MPEG HD 422 and 420 XDCAM codecs, which are the workhorse formats for broadcast television production worldwide. Only the AX700 is capable of capturing still images. All three of the cameras have a Type A HDMI connector that can output either 4K or HD, but the Z90 takes things a step further by also having an HD-SDI connector for 10-bit 422 monitoring or recording. The Z90 also features more wireless connectivity functions, including live streaming and FTP transfers that aren't found on the other two cameras. The NX80 has more streaming options than the AX700, but not as many as the Z90. However, for reasons I'll explain in a later chapter, those capabilities are not covered in this masterclass. Again, let me repeat, this masterclass does not cover the wireless streaming and FTP functions of these cameras. Z90 and NX80 operators can use an app called Content Browser Mobile to control their camera wirelessly, while the AX700 uses an app called Play Memories Mobile. And the NX80 is slightly lighter and consumes less power than the Z90, but the AX700 is even lighter and more power efficient than the NX80. So that's a quick look at the major differences between the cameras, but like I said, I can't guarantee that I found them all. At this point during my camcorder master classes, I like to lay the groundwork by taking a quick tour around the camcorder to help you get familiar with the external buttons and controls, and then we'll come back to them in later chapters for more detailed explanations. Now one thing I really love about the camera is that you never have to press the power button to turn it on. All you have to do is pull out the viewfinder, and the camera will turn on automatically. Or if you don't want to use the viewfinder, you can simply swing out the LCD panel and the camera will be ready to roll in about three seconds. Perhaps the most prominent feature is the lens, so let's begin there. Each camera comes equipped with a premium Zeiss lens with a very useful 12x optical zoom range. The lens is quite sharp with nice contrast, consistent edge-to-edge -edge brightness, and it's par focal, meaning that it stays in focus during zooming. And as you may know, very few SLR lenses are par focal. There are only a couple of negative things I can say about the lens. First, it only has one ring on the barrel, and it has to be shared for both focus and zoom. 
Second, the maximum aperture is f2.8, which isn't bad, but it's actually only f2.8 when the lens is zoomed out to its widest focal length. As soon as you start zooming in, the maximum aperture quickly ramps down to only f4. We'll talk more about this topic and how I work around it in chapter 10. Now, despite the big bold markings on the side of the lens that says 18x, the lens actually only has a 12x optical zoom range. Notice that if you read the small print, the camera only has an 18x zoom range when the clear image zoom mode is activated, which is Sony's proprietary name for what is usually called digital zoom on other cameras. Clear image zoom can be used to digitally magnify the image up to 200% when shooting in HD, or up to 150% when shooting in 4K. So is it good enough to actually use? Well, we'll do some comparisons in Chapter 12 and you can come to your own conclusions. In addition to clear image zoom, both cameras have another similar function called digital extender that can be used with any of the HD recording formats. When the digital extender mode is activated, only the middle 50% of the image sensor is used for image capture, thus giving you the approximate field of view of a lens that has double the focal length. Now, if you're familiar with the FX and DX modes on Nikon DSLRs, or center scan on Sony's FS5 and FS7, digital extender is basically the same idea, just under a different name. We'll cover this feature in Chapter 12. Of course, whether you decide to use clear image zoom and digital extender or not, let's not lose sight of just how amazing it is to have a genuine 12x optical zoom on a 4K camera with a large 1-inch sensor. This is a huge benefit that really can't be matched by other big sensor cameras that use removable lenses. The ability to instantly zoom from wide angle to telephoto and back again anytime you want is a huge benefit when it comes to shooting documentaries, sports, weddings, news, and other situations where stopping to change lenses is simply not practical. On the side of the lens, we find the zoom focus switch. As I mentioned earlier, the lens only has one ring on the barrel, so it has to do double duty for both zoom and focus. This switch is what determines how the ring is being used at any given time. Just below it, we come to the autofocus manual focus button. This is basically just an on off switch for autofocus. Now there's no light on the button itself to indicate when autofocus is activated, so you have to pay attention to the display in the viewfinder. If you see the hand icon, then the camera is configured for manual focus. And if no hand is shown, then autofocus is in control. We'll talk a lot more about both manual focus and autofocus in chapter 11. Next, we have the menu button. Not surprisingly, pressing the menu button provides access to the camera's vast menu system where you can make literally hundreds of custom changes and thousands of different combinations of changes to the camera's configuration. We'll talk about the menu system in chapter two. Just to the left of the menu button is a rotary dial that's easy to miss if you aren't looking carefully. This is called the manual dial, and it works in conjunction with these three buttons over here, iris, ISO gain, and shutter speed. For example, if you wanted to change the camera shutter speed, you would first press the shutter speed button, notice that the shutter speed is now highlighted in a gray box, and then spin the manual dial up to increase the speed, or down to decrease the speed. As with all three of these exposure controls, you can see the difference it makes to the image immediately as the dial is turned. To lock in the desired shutter speed, all you have to do is press in on the joystick at the rear of the camera. We'll talk more about exactly how to use all three of these exposure buttons in Chapter 10. It's a good idea to carefully monitor your audio during shooting, and you can plug in your headphones right here. But volume for the headphones can only be controlled via menu that we'll see in Chapter 17. Fortunately, there's also a shortcut I'll show you for getting to that menu at the press of a button. If we flip open the LCD monitor, quite a few other controls are revealed. By the way, please don't confuse the touchscreen LCD monitor with the viewfinder at the rear of the camera. So just to be clear, when I speak about the LCD panel or monitor, I'm talking about this. And when I speak about the viewfinder, I'm talking about this. The LCD panel and viewfinder are exactly the same on all three cameras, and they have excellent picture quality. One reason the viewfinder is so good is because it has an organic LED screen, or OLED for short. An OLED display works without a backlight, thus it can display deep black levels and achieve higher contrast ratios than a normal LCD viewfinder. Also, just in case you don't notice it on your own, the viewfinder can be angled up to accommodate different shooting positions, particularly if the camera is mounted on a tripod. The viewfinder also gives you the option of attaching a larger eye cup that came with the camera to help block ambient light. Personally, I don't care for it, but I suggest you give it a try and see what you think. 
Whatever you do, don't forget to take a second to adjust the optics of the eyepiece by spinning the diopter wheel so that the image in the viewfinder precisely matches your own eyesight. Something to be aware of, though, is that you can't use the viewfinder and LCD monitor at the same time. No matter what you do with the camera switches or menus, you can only see a picture on one or the other at any given time. In fact, that limitation may lead you to think that something is wrong with your camera because you may notice that the picture on the LCD screen will suddenly turn off and back on again unexpectedly, as if it has a short circuit. But don't worry, your camera is not defective. The camera uses a small motion sensor, right here, to detect when you're looking through the viewfinder, and then it will automatically switch the video output as necessary between the viewfinder and the LCD panel. Unfortunately, the proximity sensor can be easily fooled by anything that comes within about two inches of the viewfinder, and that can cause the picture to come and go unexpectedly until you get used to how it works. Now, even if you normally prefer to use the viewfinder during shooting, as I do, you're still going to need to have the LCD open sometimes in order to access the numerous controls that are hidden underneath it. Let's begin at the top and work our way down. First up is the power button, which you might never even use because power is automatically turned on when the viewfinder is extended or the LCD monitor is flipped out. But if you want to turn the camera off for some reason without retracting the LCD, you can do that by pressing the power button. Just below the power button, we come to the white balance button. To change the white balance, you press the button and then use the manual dial or joystick to cycle through the options. They are Memory B, Memory A, and Preset, which just happens to be set for outdoor at the moment. Now, if you're not very experienced with using professional camcorders, some of this might sound a little confusing right now, but don't worry. I promise it will make sense later on. In fact, there's so much we need to discuss about white balance that I'm going to skip over this button for now and come back to it again in Chapter 13. Next, we find a button that has S and Q printed just above it and a number one stencil to the side. And that tells us that this is assign button number one. Assign buttons are a standard Sony camcorder feature that has been around for years, so you probably already understand their purpose, but just in case you're not familiar with them, I'll explain. Basically, the camera has six assign buttons scattered around various locations on the camera body. Numbers one, two, and three are located in this area on the side of the camera. Numbers four and five are located on the grip, and number six is located on the right side of the lens. Each one of the assign buttons can be customized to instantly activate any of dozens of special functions which you get to choose. In other words, assign buttons allow you to easily turn frequently used settings on or off at the touch of a button without having to scroll through layers of menus. As you'll see, any of the assign buttons can be programmed for any of the available functions. Some of those functions include headphone volume, histogram, zebra, peaking, and quite a few autofocus features. We'll take a closer look at all of the assigned button choices during Chapter 8, but for now, please notice that each button, except for number 6, has been labeled with their default function, so you can either leave them programmed for that setting or you can change them to something else that may suit your needs better. In the case of assign button number 1, the default function is S and Q Motion, which is shorthand for Slow and Quick Motion. Slow and Quick Motion is Sony's terminology for overcranking and undercranking the frame rate, which is a fancy way of saying this is how you shoot slow motion and time lapse. All three cameras can shoot from one frame per second up to 120 frames per second in full quality HD, and they can shoot from one frame per second up to 30 frames per second in 4K. To me, this is one of the best features of the camera, but there are many limitations, gotchas, and caveats that need to be discussed. So we'll wait to cover S and Q motion in chapter 19. Over here, we find assign button number two, and we can tell that its default function is called status check, which as the name implies, provides instant access to the camera's status screens where you can quickly view tons of information about the camera's current configuration without having to drill down into the menu system in order to look at the individual settings. The camera's eight status pages are a big time saver and they're something you should get in the habit of using often. The first status page is called Audio, and it shows how some of the audio menus and switches are configured. But more importantly, it displays audio meters that are several times larger than the default audio meters that are normally shown in the bottom right corner of the viewfinder. Whenever you're setting critical audio levels manually, these are the meters you'll want to be looking at for maximum precision. To change to the next status page, you just flick the joystick down. Page 2 shows how the camera's various video output connectors are configured. We'll cover monitoring in Chapter 20. 
Page three shows the current functions of the six assign buttons. We'll talk more about assign buttons in chapter eight. Page four shows several wipe balance settings. Three settings that influence how the camera operates when it's set for automatic exposure and one of the many zoom settings. Page five shows you how the camera's autofocus system is set up to perform. As I said earlier, autofocus can be customized in dozens of different ways if you want to fine tune how it functions. And this page provides a quick glimpse into what those settings are. We'll cover autofocus in depth during chapter 11. Page six shows you how the camera's two record buttons are programmed to function. For example, you could configure the camera so that pressing the main record button at the rear of the camera starts or stops recording on card A, but pressing the record button on the handle starts or stops recording on card B. I'll show you how to set that up and other options in chapter seven. Page seven shows you the remaining capacity of the two memory cards. And finally, page eight provides some basic information about the remaining capacity of the battery. Pressing the status button again clears the status display completely from the screen. Next, we find assign button number three. Now we can tell that its default function provides quick access to the camera's picture profile menus. By the way, you can also reach the picture profile menus by pressing the regular menu button, but this shortcut greatly reduces the amount of button pressing required to get there. So what's a picture profile? Well, I don't want to get ahead of myself because there's a whole chapter about this topic later, but briefly, picture profile settings can be used to store a number of parameters that determine the look of the camera's picture. Those settings include such things as gamma, knee, black levels, color saturation, and others. All of those parameters can be saved together as a picture profile, and there are 10 custom picture profiles stored on board the camera. Next, we have the display button. Notice that it doesn't have a number next to it, so what does that tell us? Right, it is not an assign button, so you can't reprogram it for something else. The display button allows you to change how much on-screen information is superimposed in the viewfinder and on the LCD monitor. As we'll see in chapter four, you can use the camera's various display set menus to customize what information is shown, but the display button is handy for times when you quickly want to clear the screen of almost all the clutter. Anytime you want to play back clips that are stored on one of the memory cards, all you have to do is press the thumbnail button. And the playback mode is ready to go almost instantly. You could use the joystick at the rear of the camera to navigate through the clips to view metadata about each one or select a clip to begin playback. We'll cover the camera's playback functions later in chapter 20. To exit the playback mode and return to the shooting mode, you just need to press the thumbnail button once or twice. Over here, we find the slot select button that allows you to designate which of the two memory cards are being used at any given time. Unless, of course, you're using the camera's simultaneous recording mode to record to both cards at once. And speaking of memory cards, the two memory card slots are hidden behind this door. The slots are known as A and B. And it's interesting to note that the two slots are not equal. Slot A can accept memory sticks or SD cards, but slot B can only accept SD cards. The two card slots can be used one at a time or simultaneously if you want to have two copies of every clip for safety. You can even set up the camera to automatically record lower quality proxy files. I'll talk about recommended types of cards, simultaneous recording, relay recording, and other card related topics when we get to chapter seven. Moving around to the rear of the camera, we find the full auto switch. When this switch is activated, the iris, gain and shutter speed and even white balance would be controlled automatically and you cannot adjust any of them manually. But full auto is more complicated than just turning it on or off because there are a number of ways that its behavior can be customized. I've got a whole chapter coming up that's devoted just to helping you get better results with full auto. So let's move down to the four step neutral density filter switch. This is absolutely essential for controlling exposure and depth of field. You'll be pleased to learn that these are real optical ND filters and not just electronic gimmicks to change the gain. We'll discuss the use of ND filters in chapter 10. Next, we come to the battery slot, but unfortunately the battery release switch is located under the camera, which I think is a terrible location for it because every time I change batteries, I have to take the whole camera off the tripod to do it. If there was just one thing I could change about the camera, this would be it. The camera comes equipped with one NPFV 70A battery, which will only run the camera for a little over an hour, so you'll probably definitely want to invest in a few extra batteries and probably a standalone battery charger too. The camera doesn't come with a battery charger, so the only way to charge the battery is by plugging the camera into the included AC adapter, which obviously ties up the camera. Just above the DC in jack, 
we find the HDMI out jack. All three cameras have the same HDMI port, but only the Z90 also has an SDI out jack, which provides a high-end 10-bit 422-1080p signal with two channels of embedded audio and timecode. Although the SDI jack can output 4K, the HDMI connector on all three cameras can output either HD or 4K, depending on the type of monitor or external recorder that you're using. We'll talk more about these connectors in Chapter 21. Over here, we find the camera's main record start stop button, which should be self-explanatory. And next to that, we finally come to the joystick that I referred to several times already. Just around the corner, there's the remote jack. It uses the industry standard link protocol so it's possible to attach a wide range of remote controls from Sony and third-party manufacturers, such as Sony's RM30BP. This remote enables control of focus, iris, zoom, shutter speed, white balance, and many other settings. Up on the grip we find assigned button number 4 at the rear and assigned button number 5 at the front. As you can see by the text printed next to it, the default function for button number 4 is focus magnifier. Pressing the button once will electronically magnify the center of the image in the viewfinder by 400%, thus making it easier to check the focus. You can use the joystick to change which part of the image is being magnified, or press in on the joystick to go back to the center position. Pressing the button a second time will magnify the image 800%, and pressing it a third time will return the image to normal. You can use focus magnifier even while you're recording because it's purely a monitoring function and it doesn't affect the image that's being recorded internally or what's being output by any of the video connectors. As you can see by the text printed next to assign button number 5, its default function is for iris push auto, a quick way of momentarily activating auto exposure. We'll talk about that in chapter 10. Situated between the two assigned buttons is the zoom rocker lever, which offers pressure sensitive variable speed control for executing zooms with nice, smooth starts and stops. We'll talk about all the camera zoom controls and customizable settings in Chapter 12. Speaking of the grip, for maximum control and comfort, make sure the strap that goes over the back of your hand is tight enough that it makes the camera fit like a glove. If you find that your camera is hard to shoot with hand tilt, chances are the problem is simply that you don't have the strap tight enough. Over here, we find assigned button number 6, and it's the only one that doesn't come pre-programmed for a particular function, but you'll certainly want to give it a function, and we'll cover what options you have to choose from in Chapter 8. Under these two covers, we find a couple of more connectors. The upper one is a standard audio jack for attaching consumer-style microphones. On the AX700, this port is the only way to feed external audio into the camera without buying expensive accessories. As we'll talk about in a minute, the Z90 and NX80 also have XLR jacks on their handle, but for times when you've got your camera stripped down without the handle, in what I call the stealth mode, at least this port still gives you the option of using an external microphone. Just below it, we find a USB jack, which actually serves four purposes. First, you can connect the camera to a computer and use it as a very expensive memory card reader, but I suggest you save this function for emergencies only. SD card readers only cost about 10 bucks, so why would you want to bother using the camera? Second, when the time comes to update the firmware of your camera, you'll need to tether it to your computer via USB. Unlike many other cameras, firmware updates are not installed from a memory card. Third, you can use the USB connector to output old-fashioned composite audio and video to a monitor or some other device that has standard AV connectors. The required cable that goes from USB to AV is sold separately. And fourth, on the Z90 and NX80, you can use the USB connector with an optional cable and adapter to connect the camera to a wired router using a standard LAN cable. But as I said before, we won't be talking about the LAN port or live streaming in this video for the simple reason that setting up and troubleshooting live streaming and FTP transfers is extremely complicated, and I've chosen not to cover them at all in this masterclass. Moving to the top of the Z90 and NX80, we come to the removable handle, which is much more than just an ordinary handle for carrying the camera around. First, we have another record start stop button, and this one has a locking switch for times when you want to prevent it from being pushed accidentally. You'll also find another zoom rocker switch that gives you yet another way to zoom. The switch over here allows you to select how the rocker functions, either with a fixed speed that can be customized as you see fit, or with a pressure sensitive variable speed, or disabled completely. We'll talk more about this zoom control in chapter 12. 
At the rear of the handle, we find a standard quarter 20 threaded socket for attaching accessories. However, if you'd prefer, it can be turned into a cold shoe instead by using the special hardware that was included in the box with your camera. At the other end of the handle, the Z90 and NX80 have a special accessory shoe called a multi-interface shoe. On the AX700, the MI shoe is on top of the camera body itself. And what makes this connector so special is that it has recessed electrical contacts that can facilitate two-way communication with the camera. For example, certain devices, such as one of Sony's wireless microphone receivers, can pass audio to the camera and also get power from the camera without any wires, extra batteries, or cables. The microphone system literally becomes part of the camera rather than a cumbersome attached accessory. There are two microphone receivers to choose from. The URX PO3 is a single channel receiver and the URX PO3D offers dual channel operation. In other words, the URX PO3D can receive audio from two different transmitters simultaneously. Speaking of microphones, all three cameras have a built-in stereo microphone right here, which ought to be fine for shooting situations where capturing perfect audio isn't necessary. But for improved performance on the Z90 and NX80, I recommend attaching an external shotgun microphone using the shock mounted holder. Depending on your budget, there are quite a few microphones that will work great with these two cameras. The microphone that I use on my camera is the Sony ECM MS2. Two XLR jacks are provided on the handle under these covers for connecting external microphones, audio mixers, wireless receivers, or any other professional audio source. Finally, on the other side of the handle, we find all of the external audio controls any professional would expect to find on a camera, conveniently clustered together in one place. There's a whole chapter devoted to audio a little later, so I won't spend time repeating that information now. So that concludes our quick overview of the camera, and you should now have a pretty good understanding of the major features of the Z90, NX80, and AX700, plus a general sense of where the important buttons and controls are located. But what I haven't done is give you very much detail, and that's what's coming up in the next 22 chapters.